So, you know, Stan did a great job setting all of this up, and so I won't go into really the, the great detail on it, but really just understanding that autism is a whole body disorder, not just a kind of a mysterious brain condition. And as a whole body disorder, what happens in the body affects what's what we call downstream in the brain. So for example, if you have yeast overgrowth, then you're going to have yeast toxins and those can go to the brain. If you don't have your biochemistry working well, your neurotransmitters might not be functioning optimally. If you have a uh, leaky gut or a digestion that's not working, you might not have the nutrients that you need to, for your brain to function. If you're not breaking down the foods properly, you might be creating opiate-like compounds that will directly affect the brain. Uh, if you have inflammation in the body, you can have it systemically and you can have that in the brain. And again, this is going to affect the brain directly. So you can see how when things are going on in the body, that is going to affect how the brain functions. And so by understanding this model, this is where food comes into play and this is where diet is really important. Because when we can address the body and what's going on health-wise, we can translate that into how the brain is going to function. And that's really the goal here. If you have leaky gut or gut inflammation, we want to remove the foods that inflame the gut. We want to add good nutrients that are going to help heal the gut. If we have nutrient deficiencies, we need to get those nutrients in. Some of them in supplementation form, but as many as we can also in food form. When there's yeast overgrowth, you want to work on getting rid of that. Foods can feed yeast, as Stan mentioned, and so we want to be careful of the food choices that we make for children so that we're not feeding those. Toxicity, we want to be careful of our food supply. We want to make sure we get it as clean as possible, that our pots and pans and our kitchen equipment is going to not be adding more toxins into the system. And then when there's faulty biochemistry or biochemistry that's not optimized, we can look at supplementation for that and also possibly avoiding certain foods that might not be able to be processed by those pathways. The gut is really key because the gut is what, it, food comes in contact with the gut every time we eat. And so that food that we eat can either help heal the gut, supply the nutrients that we need to heal the body, or it can create inflammation and problems in the body and feed bad bugs and things like that. So the gut is really sort of the central hub to all of this because that's going to have that, uh, that immediate contact. But also we have to break down those foods and those foods are going to provide us amino acids which help build neurotransmitters, help absorb nutrients that we need for the cells to function. So all of these things really require the gut. So as you'll see as we go through this, a lot of the dietary choices we make are around how we can help support the gut. Everywhere I go, people always tell me different stories. And as Stan mentioned, it can be dramatic or it can be kind of step by step, a little bit as you go. And so, you know, within a few days to a few weeks of starting the diet, words will in increase. I've heard everything from going from zero words to 200 words. I've heard doubling vocabulary, all sorts of things. But language seems to be a big area that parents really report a lot of improvement. And then all sorts of other things energy regulation, hyperactivity decreasing, sleep getting better, which is just so wonderful for everybody in the family that can actually get some rest and, and, and feel better in the morning. All right, so getting into some of the nutrition basics. To me, nutrition is, or diet is two things. To me, diet is removing the problematic substances and adding the nutritious substances. And so when you hear about autism diets, you often hear about step one, remove gluten, remove casein, remove salicylates or whatever those things are. It's all about removing the things that their systems can't process. And that's a really essential step one. If you're on morphine all day long, it's not gonna matter how much vitamin C you get or whatever else is going on, you're not going to function very well. So getting out the inflammatory problematic substances. But then the second part that we often forget is these kids need nutrition, and so we need to focus on getting good nutrients into the diet to support them as much as we can. And so that's a piece I really want to talk about today. So the first thing to avoid is the food additives. And so if you're brand new, this is the best place to start because you can find, not that I'm an advocate of junk food, but you could find every candy, cookie, junk food, ice cream, whatever you want, free of artificial ingredients. You can find a substitute lollipop, you can find a substitute whatever you need that's free of these artificial things, artificial colors, flavors, preservatives, MSG is a big one, and all of the 
the hidden sources of MSG, like hydrolyzed vegetable protein and autolyzed yeast extract and all of those. So you want to read the labels and look at the ingredient <coughs> list and really go with products that are going to be free of those. What's in food? You're going to have your fats, carbs, and protein. You're going to have vitamins and minerals and amino acids and all sorts of things in there. And I wanted to talk a little bit about um, these different things. I'm going to save the fats for a moment because I'm going to get into that in more detail. I think that's an area that's very misunderstood. And then go into s carbohydrates. This is an area of carbohydrates where there's a lot of variation. So kids need carbohydrates. Even the specific carbohydrate diet is not a low carbohydrate diet. It is a specific carbohydrate diet. But we want to be careful of too many sugars, too many refined sugars, too many flour products, uh, just uh, too much just starchy food without any of the other pieces to round it out. We want to get enough good protein, and this is another area sometimes we have to put some extra effort on because sometimes kids don't like protein because it's very chewy, and so they might have a texture challenge with it. But it's important because everything that we use to build tissues, neurotransmitters, everything needs protein, and so making sure there's an adequate amount of protein is important. Okay, in terms of fats, there's omega-3s, there's omega-6s, there's monounsaturated, saturated, all of these things. Uh, just the most important aspects of it, fish oils. Um, in terms of omega-6s, usually we get enough of them, although sometimes people have to supplement something called GLA. And uh, monounsaturated is another wonderful olive oil, avocados, those types of things. So these are all things that you can just have these fats in your diet like you normally would. Uh, the big area that I want to talk a little bit about is saturated fat, because this is the area that gets really villainized. Saturated fat is especially so coconut oil is one of my favorites. Coconut oil is high in antifungals. It has caprylic acid, which kills yeast overgrowth. It has lauric acid found in breast milk, very nourishing fatty acids. Uh, it is absorbed and very easily without the need for digestion. It's just a really good fat. And it's a saturated fat. It's a plant-based saturated fat, so there's no cholesterol. But again, I don't think cholesterol is a problem. I just think that we need to not lump saturated fats and trans fats together. Trans fats are the ones we want to avoid. Those are the man-made, partially hydrogenated oils. We want to avoid those. But saturated fat actually has good properties to it. So for example, when we look at, look at all the things that saturated fat does. It's important for the brain, it's important for the immune system, for the bones, uh, all sorts of things, brain development, all sorts of things that are really key for kids. So saturated fat is not a bad thing. Uh, also cholesterol, look at all the uses for cholesterol. All the sex hormones are actually created from a base of a cholesterol molecule and then things are taken off and things are added on, but we're using that cholesterol molecule to build those hormones. We need these substances. That's why the liver makes cholesterol for us. So in terms of autism diets, there are a lot of them out there. So you know, most people here said GFCF. Uh, it's usually a really good starting place. It removes the opioids, or the potential opiates, the gluten and casein, the really inflammatory substances. From there, people will often go to, say, a, uh, eliminating maybe soy or corn or eggs, other foods that might be allergenic or inflammatory or problematic. The specific carbohydrate diet is probably the next most popular diet, and this diet really was great for helping with inflammatory type uh, bowel conditions and places where we don't want to be feeding the bad bugs. The fine goal diet or the fail-safe diet of avoid salicylates and other phenolic type substances. Those are things like apples and grapes and berries. Again, these are good foods. They have good nutrients. So it can be confusing to parents. And then people throw up their hands and say, these are good foods. Why would I want to take these out? You only would need to remove them if your particular child can't process them. And so that sulfation, methylation, those pathways, those process phenols. So for some kids, they get red cheeks and red ears and hyperactivity and all sorts of things from these salicylates. And so there are some people that really do well by removing those. 
there's the body ecology diet, which is a diet used for yeast overgrowth. There's also uh, a variety of other different diets. Weston A. Price isn't a diet, but just more dietary principles and uh, good a resource for information. And then the low oxalate diet is a little bit of a newer diet and it's more of building on some of the other things. So um, again, oxalates aren't bad either. They're often bound to calcium rich foods, so spinach and nuts and, and beans and things but they can be inflammatory for some people. So these are, so, you know, these are, um, it's going to really depend on the individual and what diet they choose. But what I want to do is start with where can everybody go? You know, you, you've probably heard, my child did this diet, my child did that one, and this one worked great, and this one, and then where do you start? So I want to give you some sense. Now that you have a sense of the different diets that are out there, usually what you want to do is kind of imagine a canvas of nourishing diet. And that can start today, it can start whenever you can add anything nourishing in. And then usually most people start with the GFCF diet or the specific carbohydrate diet. And then from there you can refine it. So you can look at phenols, you can look at uh, other yeast diets, you can look at all sorts of things and add on little components and customize the diet ultimately in the end. Gluten grains, these are things you want to avoid if you're going to do GFCF. So wheat, barley, rye, spelt. Now, realize that if you do this diet, you really need to do it 100% because these proteins and these antibodies from these proteins stay in your system for, oh boy, it depends, five days, three weeks, three months. It can be, depending on the food and the person, it can be a while. So if every week they're getting a small infraction, even if it's crumbs of something, then you're getting this inflammatory response that keeps happening and then you don't necessarily see the results you want to see. And so that's why uh, when you make a decision to do this diet, you can take some time to get into the diet and incorporate it, you know, a few weeks or whatever that might be. But when you finally get to the diet, you want to be committed that you are doing that diet 100% for say three to six months. And these are some of the hidden gluten sources, well, the, the gluten grains as well as some of the hidden sources that you want to be careful of. And the big hidden source is potato chips and potato products because they're often dusted with flour. Casein, in the case of this diet, we're going to avoid all casein, so it's all animal pro milk products uh, across the board. And then again, we have a lot of really good casein-free options as well. I'd say cheese is a little bit hard and uh, bread is, the, if out of the two things, those are probably the ones that have a little bit more trickiness. Bread texture does well with gluten and cheese really needs that casein or caseinate. But really, um, there's substitutes for everything and there's always something you can come up with. So beyond that GFCF diet, you might look at soy. I always recommend people doing soy free. Soy is very inflammatory to the gut and problematic for many reasons. Corn, corn, genetically modified corn, uh, boy, there's a lot of information on this being bad for the gut and bad for the body. So if you're going to do corn, do only organic corn and consider whether your child might have a problem with corn in general or, or look, uh, see if you notice any reaction with corn. In terms of the specific carbohydrate diet, this is a diet to consider if you have a child with a lot of gut challenges. Now it's not the only time this diet's used, but that is the main reason many of us use it is because it can help with uh, diarrhea, constipation, pain, inflammation in the gut, dysbiosis, and all of those things that are going to be fed by all of those sugars and carbohydrates. So uh, the way it works is that we remove anything that needs an enzyme to break it down. There was a study done by Horvath and they found that kids with autism have decreased carbohydrate digesting function. So they don't have the enzymes to break down those polysaccharides, the sugars and the starches, then they're more likely to feed the yeast overgrowth or whatever other bugs are in the gut. So we want to be careful about those foods for some people. You can do a lot with this diet. You can do meat, you can do eggs, you can um, at some point, depending on if you do stages, you can do nuts and you can do beans and all sorts of things. So the diet's actually, if you th at first you think there's nothing left. If I take out grains, potatoes, corn, sugars, uh, then what am I left with? But actually there's a lot of options and you can really make this, this diet work for most kids.
So with that said, I just put a few really basic supplements down here for people that might be just starting out. Calcium is always the big question. So you can do one of a couple things. You can supplement calcium. Uh, I always recommend supplementing some calcium. You can get calcium from your food too, but usually you'll want to supplement some. And you can eat, um, you know, supplement, it's usually about 800 milligrams a day is, uh, is about the average of what kids need. You can calculate how much calcium they have in their diet and figure out how much to give, or you can just give a calcium supplement or a multivitamin mineral supplement. Uh, multivitamin mineral formulas are great because they have everything all in one. But not everybody can handle all of those. So if you find that y you're having a problem and you don't know where it's coming from, you can always step back and start with some individual supplements at a time until you find out which ones work and which ones don't work. Digestive enzymes are another one that I love because this is going to help us break down foods and absorb those nutrients for kids whose guts can't necessarily do all that they need to do. Probiotics are also excellent because they're going to supply that with that good bacteria that they so much need. And one great way to do that is juicing. So juicing is going to extract and concentrate all those nutrients. And usually kids love juicing because one of the reasons a lot of kids, especially kids on the spectrum, don't like vegetables is because of the texture. And so you can get past the texture by juicing, which is really nice and really get concentrated, especially like you know green vegetables or things they might not normally drink or, or eat. You can really get some good concentrated nutrients that way. And then you can use them, ah, boy, you can use a, a, a fresh squeezed vegetable juice with some fruit juice in there to put your supplements in rather than the bottled juices. Bottled juices lose about 75% of their vitamin C before you even consume it, and that's just one of the nutrients. The phytonutrients are almost completely gone. So if you can juice your own at home, it's going to have more nutritional value for sure. Soaking seeds. So this is an area that seems sometimes that you have so much going on, why are you going to soak your stuff? But, but this is a really easy thing to do to increase the digestibility of grains. And sometimes I wonder if this part of the reason that people do so well on SCD is because there aren't any grains. Well, could we make the grains more digestible? And is there a subset of the population that would be able to handle them that way? Uh, I think that, that everybody is going to at least be able to digest what they do eat better if we do this. So it's really simple to do. Nature does all of the work. All you do is soak it in some water on the counter overnight. You can put a little bit of something alkalizing in it, like some raw apple cider vinegar in something that's a grain or uh, something a little uh, alkaline for beans. But you can just also soak them in water. And it literally takes one minute and then nature does all the rest. And it really can make a big difference. So if you're looking at making, oh boy, a rice dish or maybe a gluten-free oat something or other, make sure they're gluten-free, uh, these are ways that you can make that more digestible. And it really does make a big difference. By the way, the reason we soak it is because what we're doing is we're mimicking nature's germination process. And in that process, we're kicking off all the inhibitors, we're activating the enzymes, and allowing for those nutrients to be more available. And so, all seeds, grains, nuts, beans, seeds, all have these inhibitors. Oxalates, phytates, lectins, they can be very inflammatory to the gut. So that's the reason behind why. Fermented beverages, there's kombucha, there is uh, young coconut kefir, and all sorts of other things. These drinks are kind of fizzy, kind of sour, and they're going to impart those good probiotics. Um, you can make nut milk yogurts, you can buy coconut yogurt. So if you don't want to do dairy yogurt and you don't want to do soy yogurt, you can buy coconut yogurt. Okay, animal foods, uh, we want to just understand what's the difference between grass-fed and organic and conventional and why does it make a difference? Well, the short version of it is when you have all of this um, uh, commercial factory farms, they don't get outside, they don't get sunlight, they don't get vitamin D, they don't eat green grass, so they don't get vitamin A, they don't get the good fatty acid ratios and the and good anti-inflammatory fats, and you're going to eat a much less nutritious animal that way. So what you really want to do is focus on grass-fed or pastured. We don't want to be eating animals that are sick and unhealthy. We want to get the most nutrients we can, especially for kids that might be picky eaters that only might eat an ounce or two at a time. We want to maximize all the calories and the nutrition that we can, and grass-fed is a great way to do that. Bone broths are probably my final thing just in terms of nutrient-dense foods, but you don't want to buy them at the store because they're going to be missing all of the good gelatin. So things like chicken broth or chicken stock, beef broth, those kinds of things are going to have all that good gelatin. 
Gelatin helps healing, it helps digestion, it helps a little bit with pushing along detoxification. So good, get in, as well as rich in some calcium and magnesium from the bones. So this is a great way. So if you're looking for some help and someone says, oh, how can I help you? Ask them if they'll make you a bone broth or something, or one of you can make bone broth, one of you can make sauerkraut. Know if your child's a problem feeder or just a picky eater. To me, a picky eater is someone that you can sneak things in. They might be a little anxious about foods, but if you sneak things in, they don't know the difference. It's okay, not a big deal. Problem feeders will actually stop eating. So just know what you have and know that you have help that you can get. And see, sometimes occupational therapists and speech therapists can help, and, sometimes, and there are special feeding therapists. But just to give you a sense of just some of the general, um, you know, your average child with autism that's a picky eater, Remember opiates. Opiates are addicting. Mm -hmm. So you're going to be interested in nothing but those foods and that will make you a very picky eater. Uh, artificial ingredients can also trigger an addictive-like process. So if they only eat certain brands, consider that. Um, also just be aware of high carb cravings and sugar cravings. It could be yeast overgrowth or something like that. Um, and so just make it fun, give a small little amount. You know, some of the things that the parents tell me, you know, uh, don't make it a, too much of a big deal, but introduce it many times until you get them comfortable with it. Okay, few things about boosting. This is like, if you feel like you have a child that you can sneak things in, you just need creative ideas, this is where we're gonna talk about that. So v veggies 101, for all kids that won't touch a vegetable in their life, start with, Things like muffins, meatballs, smoothies, tr if, and a lot of kids won't eat any of those things. They'll only eat like potato chips and chicken nuggets. So try to add some of those foods where you can start to add things to it. And then you can puree things, especially like sweet vegetables or carrots and sweet potatoes or cauliflower, those mild flavored ones, crunchy pancakes. You can just use broths. You can use juicing. You can add fermented foods to things. So just some ways to start getting some of those good nutrients in. And then in terms of beginning and evolving the specific diet, so firstly, if you're going to just start GFCF for the first time, some things you can do, just start experimenting before you even do the diet. If your child likes waffles, try a GFCF waffle, try a GFCF pancake, whatever they like, try some of those foods and just see what they'll eat. You might be surprised that they might not even notice the difference in some of them. Then you'll start to gather yourself a list of things they like. You can look at resources online, get some ideas, some understanding of how to do the diet, kind of get yourself geared up. Um, step three would be create a meal plan because um, many of us think, what, what am I going to eat for dinner tonight? And you're recreating the wheel every day. Well, before you even start the diet, just take a, you know, take a list and come up with five breakfast, lunches, and dinners, or even a few that you know they'll do. Then go shopping for them. Then you can start the implementation of the diet. Usually people remove casein first, do that for a couple weeks, then remove gluten and continue the two of them for several months, three to six months. Um, that's often the way that people start it. Just a few little tips around that. Uh, I kind of mentioned this a little bit. Substitute what they already like. So you don't have to go to you know brown rice and whatever. You can start with um, this waffle for that waffle, this pasta for that pasta. Um, and be careful, don't increase the sugar too much when you're doing all of that. Um, just a couple other little things. Cross-contamination is also a big area that people kind of uh, feel a little discouraged or overwhelmed in starting the diet. So cross-contamination is that you want to be careful because any small amount of gluten or casein could be a problem. Careful of wooden cutting boards and wooden spoons, toasters, uh, bulk food bins. They can be uh, commercial fryers. So even if you find a gluten-free thing, make sure they don't fry it with the breaded pieces, uh, you know, the other breaded foods. And everything, I mean, I'm sort of generalizing, but pretty much everything else that's non-porous, you can just wash and be pretty good with. So don't feel like, I can't start the diet till I buy all new pots and pans and all new everything. Just get the basics that you need and, and you should be fine um, being just careful with everything. Just some ideas for healthy breakfast. So um, eggs, if your kids eat eggs or if you can make French toast or something that has eggs in it, getting some protein at breakfast is really important if your child's not sensitive to eggs. But you can also make 
homemade muffins with pureed uh, vegetables in them. You can make pancakes. You can puree chicken in pancakes or vegetables in pancakes. Um, you can do uh, breakfast meats, so bacon or sausage, um, smoothies, all sorts of things. Lunches, you know, this is going to depend, but don't forget thermos, like a thermos that you can bring something hot from the night before. That's always a great way to go. S uh, snacks, I try to get some protein and some fat in the snack along with the carb. So usually carbs are pretzels and crackers and chips. That's just going to be carb, carb, and carb. You want to look at uh, how can I add some nut butter to something? How can I add some, um, you know, a fruit kebab with a yogurt dipping sauce, a non-dairy yogurt dipping sauce will give you a little bit of several different things as well as those probiotics. Um, chicken pancakes are one of my favorites. You just take the cooked chicken and the eggs, blend them together and cook them up. Actually, I think we have that recipe in here. And then so let's say the carrot chips too. So chart your, you know, when you're doing all this, just make one change at a time. Don't add all the supplements at once. Don't add all of the diet and the supplements together. Just do one thing at a time and then notice how things are. Chart what's working and what's not working and then bring that to your uh, doctor or nutrition consultant, whoever it is, so they can help support you. They might see patterns that you don't see. And it really helps to write everything down because you can start to see Hmm, I'm noticing something's not so great. Oh, we added a bunch of corn in. And you can really look back at the list when you do that. And always remember, uh, you, there are a lot of resources and people that can help you. Really, uh, you diet something that you can do yourself, but you often might need some help, some support. Make sure that all their dietary needs are met. They've got enough protein, they've got enough um, calcium and all of that. So always remember there are professionals out there that can help you with all of this. And um, this is me and how to get a hold of me. And I'd say that um, if you're new or even experienced, the Facebook group that we have has been great. There's about 1,200 parents on there. And so you can ask all of your questions. What do I do for lunches? You know, I'm new to this. What do I expect? So that one has really actually been a really fun resource for people. So anyway, this is me and how to find me. And um, I just want to thank you so much.